In this podcast, Nick Howe from Area 9 talks about fixing one of the productivity and learning's biggest enemy, unconscious incompetence. So, stay tuned. Welcome everyone to Jobs of Future podcast. Today we have with us Nick Howe. Um, he's an award-winning chief learning officer and business leader with a focus on application of innovative education educational technologies. He is the chief learning officer at Area 9, one of the global leaders in adaptive learning technology and a strategic advisor to the Institute of Simulations and Training at the University of Central Florida and board advisor to multiple edtech startups. For 12 years, Nick was the chief learning officer at Hitachi Data Systems, where he built and led the corporate university and online communities serving over 50,000 employees, resellers, and customers. With over 25 years of global sales, sales enablement, delivery, and consulting experience with Hitachi, EDS Corporations, and Bechtel, Nick is passionate about transformation of customer experience, partner relationships, employee performance through learning and collaboration. With that, Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So, um, Nick, by the way, amazing background. So when I was looking at your profile and uh, I think I was stuck on almost everything was a keyword and that's that's really helpful when you're picking out a, a guest uh, to come on the show. And thank you so much for 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 picking it up and and gracefully agreeing to to speak to our our audience about your your perspective. So why don't you walk us through your journey um, as uh, to to your current role? Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting question, and it's one that I've asked peers who do the same job as me. So uh, I have this title, Chief Learning Officer. Um, it's not very well defined. Uh, and varies quite significantly, and the routes to get here are tend to be very different. So, uh, I started out as an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer originally. Worked in the North Sea, the Middle East, designing oil rigs, pipelines. You know, classic engineering kinds of things. And then through, I think I'm kind of on my fifth career now. <laughs> through a series of, I suppose, relatively small moves, I've ended up very much in a, a people centric role so from engineering into computer-aided design from computer-aided design into it from it into it services from it services into education services and then you know the kind of the global responsibility for education so uh, you know the a, a very people-centric role like i have is about as far away from kind of a pure engineering job as you can get but the steps to get here were quite small um, and what you find is that people who look after learning inside large corporations generally come from one of two routes. They either come up through the business as I did, uh, or they come up through the HR mm. world. And that tends to give you quite different perspectives and different approaches to how you go about looking at talent. Um, now, at the moment, I'm working for uh, an executive at this small company, Area 9, and we are a software company in the talent space. So the chief learning officer role in an ed tech company is quite different than the chief learning officer at Hitachi or Verizon or Walmart or somewhere else. And we can talk about that if you want. Yes, absolutely. So let's talk about your current role as a chief learning officer for Area 9. What is Area 9? If you can walk us through that and, and what's your role in that? Yep. Uh, so we are an education technology company, originally based out of Denmark, now uh, based out of Boston and uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, originally started by doctors, two doctors and two computer scientists looking to address the challenges of medical errors originally. Mm. So why do very well-educated doctors make mistakes? And is there something about the education process that could be changed to better solve that? Because that that problem is not limited to doctors. It's mm. you know in every role in every industry. Why do people do what they do? Why do people make mistakes? And what can we do to help address that problem? Can we improve the learning process? And over the course of twenty years, those four partners built and sold one company, and now have built Area Nine. And we specifically focus on using 
advanced technology to improve the learning process and to teach pretty much anybody from mm. sales assistants in retail all the way up to board certified physicians and, and find new ways to teach them and improve the way that people can learn. So I have a number of responsibilities. I'm chief evangelist for the company, helping spread the word about what is possible. Mm. Um, some of the things that we may talk about during the podcast, many people in the talent space don't even know are possible. They mm. think it is still the future. Um, and one of my favorite quotes um, is you know, that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And this is one of those great examples. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, uh, of something which is available today, but not very well uh, distributed. So part of my job is to help educate the industry generally on what is possible. Um, and then to look at the things that we're doing for our clients and making sure that they are of the highest scientific and evidence-based approach. Uh, and again, one of the things that we might get into as we talk about the application of data and mm. uh, in the talent space is that unfortunately, even here in 2018, there is a lot of smoke and mirrors and snake oil with mm. regard to education. Uh, that there are a lot of practices that have been around for a long time that just are not based in evidence and not based in science. Uh, it's like, you know, doing data analytics with random numbers. I mean, mm. you know, you've got to bring evidence-based practice. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Interesting. And and thank you so much for watching, walking us through that. So one of the things that, that, that fascinates me about um, this field of learning uh, um, is how much of new skills are emerging right how much so i recently i was talking to one of the one of the senior executive at cisco and he was he was telling me vishal when uh, the shelf life of a skill is shrinking and the amount yeah. uh, time it takes you to to reskill yourself in that skill is the same or uh, probably it's not shrinking as fast everything throws out of the window so in that in that when that's the case how how like how have you seen learning evolved throughout like when you were with uh, your previous stints and 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 comparing uh, what's what you're seeing now we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast yeah um, the emphasis has shifted and, and has to shift and will continue to shift. Uh, the, I mean, if you look at the entire scope of education, from kindergarten all the way through corporate, um, that really hasn't changed a lot in the last 200 mm. years. Right? It was geared to teach people in a world that, day to day wasn't changing very rapidly and the core capabilities and skills they needed weren't changing very rapidly clearly we live in a very different world today and the fundamental thing that's changed has been the availability of information i mean the fact that you know we all carry these things and have the world's knowledge at our fingertips it is no longer necessary to memorize and and intrinsically learn deeply learn some of the things that we used to have to you know, you had to remember phone numbers because, you know, when you were out and about, the only choice you had was go to a phone box and, and dial someone. Now, you know, I don't know anybody's phone number because it's all just stored in this damn thing. Um, and that's a trivial example of something which is much deeper that you can, I, I generally split learning into two fundamental areas, the just in case versus just in time. Mm. Right. And people often confuse these things, um, but they are very different, but are both necessary. There has been a movement over, I mean, YouTube's now been around since 2005, so the last 13 years. And often in education, people look at kind of the YouTube generation or look at how people use YouTube in their day to day lives and say, well, if I want to repair, you know, a leaky tap, I just look it on YouTube and I Google it and I, I know how to do it. And that's all well and good, 
but it isn't a panacea. Mm. And the best example of that is when Sully Sullenberger lost both engines on 1549 and had to land in the Hudson, the last thing you wanted mm. was him coming over the radio going, just give me a minute while I Google what to do. Mm. Right? So there is, in every role, a need for that just-in-case learning, that foundational second nature learning. And it doesn't matter whether I'm doing data analytics or whether I'm doing health and safety in the petrochem industry or I'm flying a plane or whatever it is. There is, there, there is and will continue to be absolutely foundational knowledge that we need to have in order to be able to make the right decisions in the right time and to know when to go and look up information and when maybe I should call in an expert and not do it myself. So this challenge of how do we educate people for jobs that don't exist yet? Well, if we acknowledge that some of the core knowledge is going to be turning over very, very quickly, mm. the question then is, so what are the skills that people need in order to be able to cope in that environment? What skills do we need in order to recognize when knowledge is outdated? and that skills are no longer relevant, and that we need to learn something new, or I need to bring in someone else or work in a team. And so uh, what we've been looking at in Area 9 is a shift from very much cognitive education. The last hundred years, teaching people knowledge. And what we've seen is the growth of the knowledge worker through that computer boom but what it now knowledge is ubiquitous you know everything trends to commodity knowledge is so that what we're now looking at is what Charles Fidel at Harvard calls four, four dimensional learning which is knowledge skill character things like curiosity mm. and ethics and then the metacognition, learning how to learn. And, mm. and we'll, we'll, I think we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the podcast. Um, but the, as we look to the jobs for the future, the core has to be what are those fundamental elements of knowledge, skill, character, and meta-learning that then allow you to operate very well in that rapidly changing environment where knowledge is evolving moment by moment. Interesting. Uh, so I think one thing that, that you pointed out that uh, remind me of a conversation. Uh, so you said that uh, the way knowledge, uh, how we gain knowledge through kindergarten and school days, it hasn't changed for quite some time. And I, I'm coming from a, from a AI end. And then it's, it's yeah. always funny to me to see my daughter when she goes to school and we have a race to say getting a grade of A or whatever like efficiency. And I know that the the higher you push for efficiency, that's automation. That that's automation right there and then, right? Yeah. So we are pretty much grooming and and brewing our kids um, or this through this system to l jump for efficiency. But efficiency is automatable. So in a way, we are sort of training them to be obsolete uh, in, in in certain ways. And and that has now when we when when they come to the real world, uh, that's then the dichotomy hits when now the world is now they have to think of a solution. There is no structured yeah. way of getting a plus in your in your day to day tasks. So and businesses are to many degree eating up for that cost of retraining these workforce to be very creative and thinker. And you pointed out like four dimensional learning. Yeah. What's what's your thought on that? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. There, I, I think it was, now I'm never good in who said what, but I think <laughs> it might have been it was the head of Ford or the head of GE, one of the kind of titans of industry, who said, you know, the worst crime is to do efficiently those things that you should never do mm. in the first place. So uh, yes. I would argue that the focus, first and foremost, effectiveness, right? We've got to be teaching kids and adults 
the things that are going to be useful to your point mm. right we have to be focused on teaching kids and adults to think critically to be self-aware to be able to make decisions and make decisions under pressure to have an ethical outlook to be curious to be creative and you know there are i don't know whether you've watched the TED talk that Sir Ken Robinson did mm. about the way that the school systems are almost designed to kill creativity True. in kids. Right? So we've got to undo some of those things. And a lot of the way that we're going to do that is through this idea of personalized learning and personalization, that we cannot continue to treat Everybody is just this mass of empty vessels into which we can just pour stuff, which is really what the schooling model has been and mm. largely what the corporate learning model is. We have some stuff we want to teach you. We, are, we want to open your head and pour it in so that you know it. And we don't care how quickly you learn. We don't care what kind of mood you're in. We're just going to put you all in one big group and then try and you know, hope that you learn something. Uh, and what we have now, and have had for quite a few years, is the ability to personalize that experience mm. and to create those learning opportunities that are going to be unique to your daughter, that have the ability to tap into the things that she's interested in and can help her reach her maximum potential in a very personalized way and to, be, and to be able to do that at scale, to do that not only for your daughter, but to do that for millions of kids and for millions of workers, that we've got to get away from this one size fits none approach, mm. right? We, we've been talking about mass customization mm. for 20 years, mm. right? We've talked about it in retail. We've talked about it in all kinds of other industries. Well, now finally we are talking about it in education and frustratingly for me, as a head of learning in a large corporation as I was at Hitachi is that actually public schools have been much more innovative than corporate has. Mm. Right? Some of these new things around how we personalize education for kids using technology in the classroom to create that personalized experience. There's been some great work done in the U S and elsewhere to advance personalized education for kids and, and only now are we beginning to see the first promises of that inside corporations and I, I think it's long overdue because we have to use that if we're going to tackle some of the problems you were talking about interesting no i think well said and it's it's, it's funny like so i've been uh, i'm on advisory for many of the university when it comes to their data science curriculum and it's yeah. kind of an oxymoron for me uh, that situation because i as a business, I suffer to get someone to help me out right now. And when I talk to this, this university, they say, hey, in 18 months, we'll prep this guy to maybe support you, if at all, right? So now, as, as a, and I'm a small business, so as a small business, I'm always on this challenge of how I can get someone quickly to solve the current challenges of the world today. And yeah. 18 months down the line, getting a slingshot of something probably working there, it doesn't it doesn't resonate very well uh, with 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 many of the companies and that's that's when i said okay can ai help and and i think when i was looking at area 9 uh, i was reading some of those signatures that, that yes probably ai could like what's your perspective on how how something like an ai or something um, like technology could help bridge that skill gap that that is being created by this educational institutes that is a big question, <laughs> a multi-dimensional question. Um, so, God, that could go in so many different directions. Um, we could talk about uh, the gig economy. Mm. Right? We could talk about how you even get access to those types of resources. You know, one of the things that we've seen in the last few years is a fundamental shakeup about the way that work and companies are structured hmm. uh, right and the idea that it isn't always necessary to have to you know recruit people in with new skills or to spend a long time building your own skills that hmm. you can potentially now go out to the market for relatively granular skill uh, for a, a short duration of time um, but 
that is still a problem if, as you talked about, you're in an area where things are developing rapidly and it is, regardless of what you do, it's going to take a long time to build skills. You know, if you're going to hire in or if you're going to use gig or, or whatever you're going to do. The question then is, can we accelerate the time to proficiency? Can we mm. shorten that year and a half? Um, and technology certainly has a role to play in doing that. Because in many of the, the cases, regardless of whether you are going to go to a university and study in a classroom environment, or whether you're going to do some kind of MOOC and some online university course, in many cases there are still time constraints. They're going to feed content at you at a rate of their choosing, not of your choosing. And that experience is not going to be personalized to you. I don't care how good a teacher or a lecturer you are. If you've got 50 or 100 or 200 people in a class, you're probably going to teach to the middle. And that the folks at the bottom are really going to struggle and the folks at the top are going to be bored. And so we've seen in the data that by taking a more personalized approach, by leveraging narrow AI to create personalized online teaching experiences, you can at least cut that in half for most people. What we've seen is that for any given length of curriculum, that a professor would think, yes, it's going to take 10 weeks to do this. Mm. By taking a much more personalized approach, most of the people can probably do that in half the time or less. And that the star performers are going to get through it in a quarter, a fifth of the time. So to your point, we have the ability to question some of the fundamental assumptions about how long it takes to achieve certain things by leveraging capabilities. I mean, what we're trying to do in software is recreate at scale the experience you'd get if you had a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Right? Mm. Imagine how quickly people would learn if every single one of them had a personal tutor that would adapt to their particular needs, could, could recognize the things they know and don't know, recognize the experience, recognize their mood they're in in the moment, recognize whether, am I learning this stuff or is it, am I really struggling? and to be able to adapt in real time. And what we've seen is that narrow AI can play that role. Now, you know, how that's, where that's going to go in the future and how far that's going to go, you know, we can discuss as we, as we get later <laughs> into the podcast. But at least for the moment, that technology exists um, and it has the ability to shorten that. The, the other aspect of that, of course, is that um, and one of the things that I'm particularly interested in gets back to what I said earlier, which is, should you even be learning those things? Mm. Right? Just because it's an 18-month course, do you have to wait 18 months before you become productive? Are there particular aspects of that that are more applicable and can be put to good use much more quickly? Right? Can we take someone better understand what is actually needed in order to be successful and focus in on that that might take one or two months instead of 18 months. Interesting. Right? We don't have to put everybody through everything just in case. This gets you know, back to the just in case. What are What is the core set of things for any given role that you really need to know? And then what else can you call on as and when you need it? Interesting. No, I think you, so you are saying something pretty cool here. So I, I remember talking to one of the futurists a um, couple of months back and he was telling me, hey, Vishal, do you know what the future would be a world? So there would be no chefs. I said, what do you mean by that? So he said the world, the future would be a lot of souppreneurs and sandwichpreneurs, right? So there would be just in case, as, 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 you, as you're pointing out, very sort of tactical. So you don't have to have the entire chef course of 17 years just in two hours learn how to make a good sandwich and just make that and deliver and then you'll probably be a lot, lot more successful. That's a pretty yeah. radical way to think um, considering every guy that I hire I, or gal I hire, we have to train and all that. Um, so you talked about um, 
learning how to learn right so what's what's yep. your what are you seeing in that space we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast so that's one of the things that i'm particularly interested in uh, um, so if we go back to the story i was telling you about how the company was started mm. why do people make mistakes mm. in the workplace right whether that is a doctor or you or i mm. there is this model that as i say typically we we teach to gaps people don't know things they need to know things let's teach them those things let's fill in the gaps in their knowledge or their skill or whatever there is something called the dunning kruger effect mm. and that is that people everybody has an overestimation of their ability to do things it it's a natural human trait and it's probably a core of our right we we have to believe we are capable of doing things if, you know if we're going to survive out in the in the veld when we got tigers and all kinds of things that are trying to kill us um but it can be incredibly dangerous and in our own data that we've seen both in universities and in corporations there is this thing called unconscious incompetence mm. that situation where someone thinks thinks they know something or thinks they know how to do something when in fact they don't mm. and it is surprisingly common mm. and frighteningly common mm. the evidence says that across sales and technical and medicine and pretty much everything we've had experience of people are 15 to 40% unconsciously incompetent by that i mean of the things that we are trying to teach them they think they already know 15 to 40% when in fact they don't hmm that they have a fundamental misconception about either their knowledge or their way the world works now and that may be perfectly um understandable there may be very good reasons why that is and particularly if hmm. we go back to the start of the conversation knowledge is changing so quickly hmm. that you may think you know something but that's because it used to be true and is no longer true right it used to be the only way you could consume tv was through a big square box that was set in mm. your living room now you've got youtube and you know a thousand other different ways hulu to consume content well i the world has moved on and if you've never heard of youtube then you're going to have a mental model about how mm. to consume training that's it's just because you've never been exposed to it but that's unconscious incompetence i i didn't even know that was possible right you know, the only way to watch tv is is through a box on the wall actually that's not true anymore and but that applies in medicine it applies in sales it applies in programming it applies in anything and so this issue of learning how to learn self reflection being self aware and and being open to the idea that things that i absolutely believe to be true mm. may be false mm. um is fundamental and, and as we talk about the future of of talent and the future of skills and how we can cope in this environment where things are changing so quickly then being open to the idea of being wrong and being and being fully ready to change one's opinion when new evidence is presented is possibly the most vital skill that anybody can have and so that that's part of that that 4D model that that meta learning it's the ability to be open to new ideas and and to take advantage of some of those other characteristics of curiosity and some of those things um but i would argue that it doesn't matter whether it's you know your daughter or whether it's a ceo in a corporation not being overconfident mm is is fundamental to your ability to succeed going forward 
it's it's funny. Uh, so I think exceptional points, by the way. So as a technologist, when I talk to a peer technologist, right? So I said, hey, now somehow we get a lot more um, into the spine of business because of technology is now running almost every business. The thing that that keeps me up at night is my biases or sort of my yeah. and and you are hitting on some of the some of the key pointers on, on unconscious incompetencies there, right? So I yeah. almost like every time I talk to a technologist, I ask him, hey, how do you keep yourself bias free? Because if you have your your bias, somehow your entire company is depending on your biases now. Yeah. And how do you keep it safe? And I get surprisingly funny responses saying, hey, I read a lot or I do things a lot. It's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, I think you have a spot on um, observation there that uh, unconscious incompetence is really, really, it, it keeps, it's, it, it's my paranoia. Like what if I'm yeah. wrong? Well, and, it, and, it's, and it's an insidious problem in that um, reading doesn't necessarily help. Hmm. And even studying yeah. The wrong way doesn't help because if you think you already know, then you know all those other biases. There are something like, I think the last time I checked, something like 120 or 127 identified biases mm. that people have, and one of those is confirmation bias mm. that you were you are predisposed to seek out information that confirms the things you already believe to be true, true. and so. Uh, if you combine with that, then the fact that you don't necessarily pay attention to the, uh, or certainly as much attention to things you already think you know, then a normal approach to teaching isn't going to help you. Because if it disagrees with your worldview, you're going to dismiss it. If it agrees with your worldview, you're going to accept it. And if someone tries to confront your worldview, unless that is done in a very intelligent way, if you think you already know it, you're probably going to dismiss it. And so one of the things that we've been looking at and the research that we've done over the last 10 years is, is at cognitive psychology and cognitive behavior. And can you look at how to overcome that problem systematically? Can you build into software in this case the things, the techniques that a tutor would use to try and uncover those situations where people have misconceptions about things, where they're deluding themselves, and it and it has to be very systematic and very deliberate. And this is why, you know, YouTube is not the panacea as mm. a teaching tool. Right? You cannot, unfortunately. It would be great if you could just trust everybody that they could just go and look at something and learn it and the world would be a better place. The human brain is frightening in its ability to mm. deceive. Mm. Unbelievable in its ability to deceive. And, and every person is unique. Every person is unique. Uh, and that's come out of the research. It's, it just the, When we look at the data that comes out of the tools that we deploy, it absolutely screams that you cannot just trust people that you can give them content. There's this huge move in corporations today for user-generated content. Mm. If only we have all this available in a content repository, people can search for it and they'll know how to do things. Well, that's great, except people aren't robots. Mm. Right? People are not simply machines that you can program and you can safely assume when you give them new information, we'll take it in and they're good to go. You have to put a lot of effort into overcoming those biases in a very systematic way if you're going to get them to absorb and truly internalize new ways of doing things it's i think it's it's funny so um one thing that that we we heard a lot from our our, our end so we are designing a an ai tool to help with the learning and sort of build connecting folks um, with other people so yeah. before before we decide to do that tool we we survey a lot of professionals and say, hey, who do you seek uh, connect with for mentoring and and sort of and buddy system and all, all that? Like, how do you learn in professional uh, environment? Who, how are you learning from other people? And most of these folks said, hey, you know what? I have uh, a, a, my buddy that I go to coffee with. He sits next to my cubicle, 
he sits he is my manager or he is my manager he is a vp in mm-hmm. my company that i'm that he's uh, he's happily to agree to help me out or he is a cousin's blah 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 who just exited this so it we we sort of when we were capturing all these notes together we were scratching our heads that hey like how our brain is deceiving us in in helping us connect as you rightly saying that hey i'm not qualified to decide who probably could help me because i like i am a very social person and the thing that i will and people have like you you can say they have a race thing they have a they have a social construct they have like all the things but nothing is professional competence that hey we are like he probably could he has done whatever i am doing now and probably he could he could lead me away so i think your point of uh, in um, unconscious incompetence how how do you think we could fix that problem uh, if you can walk us through that yeah um so i just want to come back to something that you said because it's quite interesting um you know this phrase fake news that uh, yeah. that someone here in the us has made very famous um i think we have to acknowledge that um there may be different opinions but there're really only one set of facts. Mm. Um but often those things are very difficult to distinguish. And if we go back to what you were saying earlier, um a, a core competence a skill that that people have to develop which I I think as an engineer is one of the things that I was trained to do mm. is to apply that critical thinking to not take on face value. Um and so you, you absolutely mentors and others should be a fundamental part of how you learn mm. but as you go through that process that doesn't excuse you from applying that level of critical thinking mm. as to who is this person mm. and are they qualified to give me this information and is it current and is it applicable and does it are there multiple sources of this information that can be corroborated and are those those sources valid um so but when it comes to unconscious incompetence then there is fortunately that there's a very simple mechanism that can go a long way to solving that problem and it is simply asking people to rate their their confidence in their knowledge or in their skill um and it and it's a simple question you could do it with your kids right if you are mm. if you're sat with your kids at the table and you're asking them about a math problem then simply asking the question how sure are you that that's the right answer forces that self reflect to happen well actually no no i'm not all right mm. why aren't you sure about that mm. oh yes i'm absolutely confident all right well that oh no the answer's wrong but i was so sure so this so what's wrong what what's wrong with my mental model i was really sure that that was the right answer but it's not mm. so forcing that self reflection and again although the human brain is incredibly good at deceiving us mm. it's also in, incredibly you know one of the things that we've learned over the last few years as we as we've studied neuroscience is that there is this thing called neuroplasticity Mm. but it doesn't really matter how old you are you still have the ability to learn and learn mm. very well and that things that we thought were traits that were kind of so deeply ingrained that you're never going to get rid of them actually are very plastic and you mm. can adjust and learn and simply that process of self reflecting so one of the things that we've done in the software that we use for teaching is to build in that confidence assessment we ask people mm. to constantly self reflect and then we're able to act on that for those situations i mean there's a little kind of two by two grid you know if i ask you something then either you are going to know it or you're not going to know it or kind mm. of something in between um and you're either going to be conf- you're confident so if i truly do know it and i'm confident that's great that's i know it the world view is is fine fantastic we want you to use that in your day-to-day job if i know it but i wasn't confident well that's great also because we can boost your confidence yes you were right feel confident that you can go on and do that if you got it wrong or if you didn't know 
if you can openly say, I do not know the answer to that question, which is one of my favorite things, right? Mm. The ability to say, I do not know, mm. is vastly underrated. Mm. But be open and I say, I don't know. Great. Well, that's something we can teach you. The killer is unconscious incompetence. Mm. Yes, I know the answer and I'm confident in the answer. Oh, damn, I'm wrong. And so that's how we use that part, how we partly how we use that confidence measure. It's to help build confidence with things that you already know but aren't too sure about, but to force you to confront those things that you're confident about but are wrong. And there are various techniques that you can then employ to help people recognize those problems and to overcome it. And you won't do it just in once. I mean, one of the mm. other big learnings, and again, as we talk about how you build skills going forward, this is particularly important as things change more and more quickly. Throughout an entire careers, we've been kind of taught that learning is a one-time experience. Mm. Right? Your daughter will study statistics at a certain level once, and then she'll move on. We will go in a company we will go and take a training course once mm. and then we'll never take it again that's not how the brain works you need multiple exposures to learn right? now if you're in a very heightened emotional environment if that tiger is attacking you yeah you're pretty pretty mm. quickly going to remember stay mm. away from tigers mm. but you don't tend to get that level of emotional um effort insight when you're learning things normally and so to overcome that you have to have multiple exposures so as well as asking people to self-reflect on their confidence we also build into the software multiple exposures to learning so that you can build those neural connections so mm -hmm. you can create that truly internalized knowledge the, the technical term is automaticity mm -hmm. uh, but it's that second nature Right? It's how do I get from the point where I've got to look something up every time to the point where it's just second nature and I can do it. You know, that difference between hiring a plumber to come and unblock your sink or you going onto YouTube. Right? The next time the sink blocks, you're probably going to have to go back to YouTube because <laughs> you won't remember it. Right. Whereas the plumber will just know because he's had those multiple exposures and that experience. Interesting. So um, one question I was, I was thinking about is, so in the world of kitty videos, right? and shrinking attention span. How is the learning landscape? Like how is your software changing uh, to cope up with this current? It, it's funny, like yesterday I was uh, having a conversation with my team and we we're talking about what about a masterclass for 60 minutes? That's it, just tell one this guy yeah. to just throw in, dump in everything in one hour. That's it and be out. I don't know, need to deal with you for like three months for a course. Yeah. So how are you coping up? All right, so the, there's, we need to unpack that a little bit because the, there are quite a few things that, that got wrapped up in there. So first of all is this statement about attention span shrinking. Mm. The, uh, I would argue the jury is out on that. Mm. Right? We shouldn't, again, we shouldn't confuse um, availability bias mm. with mm. something that is fundamentally changing. So... Mm. It is true that when you look at YouTube viewing data, that there is an ideal size for an ideal length to get the maximum eyeballs on your video. Mm. Right? And depending on which study you look at and what the subject is, it varies between about two minutes and seven minutes. Mm. Right? But you will quite happily go to the movies and spend mm -hmm. two hours watching mm -hmm. a movie, right? So your attention span isn't two minutes. If you're watching a movie, it's two hours. Now, there are things that they do in the movies in terms of changing scenes and in mm -hmm. heightening music and all mm -hmm. types of other things. The fundamental question is, is, how do you hold people's attention? And then if you can't hold their attention, how do you cope with that? Mm. Right? Is the viewing habit on YouTube more to do with the fact that there's a lot of crappy videos that people stop watching after not a lot of time, mm. as opposed to everybody's attention span is super short? 
Mm. Now, when it comes to learning, so to your one hour class example, so ideally, what you want is very effective learning. Mm. And that means I want someone to be paying attention. So this gets to the heart of your question. Can someone pay attention for an hour? Well, certainly not if you just talk at them for an hour. Mm. No, they're not. Part of it is, you know, it says in your short-term memory, you can hold between three and seven things in short-term memory at any mm. one point in time. Mm. If you overload that, you're kind of screwed. So that's part of what being a good teacher is. It's understanding how people learn and how much information you can present at one point and when people need opportunity to reflect and the fact that you probably need to repeat things multiple times during that hour. And then if you can build into that one hour, not only reflection points for the learner, but what is called formative assessment. Can you build into that one hour a way as an instructor to figure out, are people actually learning what I'm telling them? Mm. Right? You cannot just stand at the front of a room mm. or in a video and just talk for an hour and just hope that everybody's going to learn it. But if every few minutes you can build into that process a feedback mechanism, and again, this kind of goes back to the original engineering days, you know, mm. feedback is a well understood process. Can you build a feedback mechanism that tells the instructor, yes, people are getting this, it is okay to move on to the next thing? or actually they're really struggling with this, we need to go back and cover it. And so it's much less, that there, there are some fundamental things about attention and there are fundamental techniques on how you hold people's attention and there are absolutely some bad practice mm. on how you can destroy people's attention or you can create a cognitive overload situation where you're just giving them too much or you're playing a video and you're telling them something at the same time, and the brain just fritzes completely. And again, but again, this is all well understood science, and you can build that into software, and that's mm. what we've done. So, you know, some people, their attention will stay for a very long time, and great, let them have at it. Some people are going to struggle because, you know. So here's here's real data. I always like to go to real data. Mm. So there was a study at one of the universities in North America when they looked at uh, how people perform on a simple test and they controlled for all the other variables. The only thing they changed was whether someone had a hot drink or a cold drink before they did the test and they got different results. So even as simple mm. as whether I've had a cup of coffee, not that it's for the caffeine, but simple for the temperature mm. of the drink can affect how well you learn and how motivated you are and how much attention you pay. So what we are tempted to doing in software, and this kind of gets to the narrow AI part, is to measure very, very frequently how the learner is interacting mm. and then be able to adjust. Because that's the big thing we've learned. In the same way that when you're driving, you're constantly paying attention to the road and adjusting. You know, you don't hold the steering wheel for five minutes, close your eyes, and then look up and turn the wheel. It's too long. You've got to react much more quickly, and it's the same with learning. So can I teach for an hour? Absolutely. If I build into that process those mechanisms that are going to let me adjust and make sure that people are coping so this whole attention span thing mm. there, there's this thing called micro learning oh we've got to chop everything mm. up into one minute things no not true as long as you build in the scaffolding mm. to cope with the way that the brain works interesting interesting now, now let's let's spend some time on on the business end right so if yeah. i'm a business and i care about my folks getting at, at the, the top of their skill game what are some of the things that I could do to to train these guys to like what are some of the things or some of the precautions or some of the um, measures that I could take so that my folks are always on top of things somehow? Most 
training today, most reskilling today in most corporations, I would argue is a waste of money mm. because there is so much bad practice mm. in place. Um, we have known for a very lo long time what works in training. Mm. We, we know the techniques that are going to give you good learning outcomes. Unfortunately, those techniques are almost never used. Right? And it's as simple as some of the things that I was saying, recognizing that I not expect to put someone in a class one time and think they now know everything. Mm. Right? You cannot put everybody through exactly the same e-learning course right. and expect that everybody's going to take exactly the same thing away from it. So the more that you can treat people as individuals, the closer that you can get to that one-on-one -on -one tutor like experience, you're going to get three things. You're going to get effectiveness. People, because mm. Why do we exist? Why does a chief learning officer exist? Why does a training mm. organization exist? Their goal is to improve someone's capability fundamentally. Mm. So your first thing has to be, Let's find the most effective way of building that capability for that individual within the cost that we've got available to us. Because right? mm. everybody's got to work under a budget. So let's look at what the evidence says about how people learn and put that into practice. Mm. The second one is, if we treat everybody as individuals, then we can look at the benefits of efficiency. Mm. Right? We have shown that if you teach in a personalized way, you can roughly halve the amount of time it takes someone to become proficient in something, which doesn't sound like much. But if I've got 10,000 employees and I want to put them through two days of training, that's 160,000 hours. Mm. Well, if I can halve mm. that, that's 80,000 hours. That's 40 man years I've just saved in one training course, mm. right? That's like having 40 more people in your company. Mm. And so the benefits that you can accrue are absolutely huge. So we can improve effectiveness by teaching properly. We can improve efficiency by personalizing. And then the last one that shouldn't be underestimated is that certainly online learning, although I, I have to give credit that you know, most of the new approaches to programming, training, um, or even though they're online, are very interactive. You know, you mm. are doing exercises, you are creating code. That is fantastic. Being able to build in interactivity is one way of overcoming that, um, those short attention spans. Mm. And so the idea, the, one of the worst things you can do is just sit there and watch a video. Right? That's mm. a very passive way. That does not lead to good learning outcomes. And much e-learning can be very demotivating. So the third thing that you want to look for is that training experience should be a motivational experience. Right? Mm. People should feel good at the end of it, not just because they went into a classroom and had some good donuts, but because they felt that they learned something through that experience and it was valuable to them. So... You know, again, I, I don't want to turn, turn this into an advert for what we do, but I would encourage anybody who is involved in education to look at and to really, really evaluate. Uh, do, are we taking evidence-based practice? Are we, are we using what we know about how people learn when we teach them? Are we treating everybody as a faceless mass or are we truly personalizing and giving individuals what they need in order to be successful? And as we do that, are we respecting the individual so that they get a motivational experience rather than, oh my God, it's another compliance course that I've got to take and it's utterly demotivational. Interesting. Interesting. And, and so in, in your experience so far um, on, on companies helping their employees reskill themselves, like, what are some of the things that you see that companies are not are doing wrong or are not doing correctly? 
Uh, well, just teaching in very bad ways <laughs> is, the, is the short circuit. Um, the good thing is is partly that recognition. I mean, one of the one of the most frustrating things is that many companies seem to be happy to recruit from outside and not develop their people inside. So, um, people companies will say, you know, people are our greatest asset. And then are quite happily to fire them on, lay them off at the at the slightest mm. downturn, mm. uh, downturn, right? So th there's a wonderful one of my favourite phrases is that you know, without people, companies are just depreciating assets. Mm. Right? It's all about the people, and mm. so recognizing that you have to invest, but to invest in very in scientifically valid and evidence based ways. Um, is the best way to get there, and whether that's reskilling or just on onboarding new employees or folks that you're bringing in from university, whatever it happens to be, you know, using the best techniques are going to give you the best outcome as a company, but also going to give you the best outcome for that individual. Um, and also, I mean, the the other one of the other best practices that I see when people are reskilling is, you know, IBM used to have this wonderful phrase: "Start your career at IBM." in a full recognition mm. that they were going to invest in you, but maybe you were going to go somewhere else. Mm. Right? The, the job market is so fluid today. Mm. There are so many opportunities today. Practice is, I am going to invest in you in the hope that you will stay mm. and that you will contribute with the company. Those companies that are afraid that people are going to leave if we train them are so short-sighted. Mm. I mean, that is a, that's a going out of business strategy if ever I heard one. Right? You, you've you've got to have the best set of people you possibly can. And to do that, you've got to invest in them. I um, think and so any, any investment is, is better than none, but you know, spend your money wisely and don't throw it away. Interesting. No, I think you're raising one of the one of the very interesting points. So, I remember um, uh, one of the gentlemen that uh, he came to me and he was with one of the IT companies for last three to four years, and and he was given Employee of the Year award, um, and then he was let go, and then he he came to me saying he's a very good speech to text analytics guy, and and said Vishal. I, I gave his resume to one of the very good speech to text analytics um, company that I and, and say hey, this guy is a keeper. Take it because he is the best as per as per this company, which is the, which is the best. Mm -hmm. And the the guy said this guy is obsolete. He is old school. He's outdated. He's blah blah blah. And then I realized that, and th this guy came to me that, uh, hey, whose responsibility is is it that I stay employable? Right. Yeah. You said, I give this company my X years. And, and you're raising a very good point that start your career. How much company is investing in your employability? And after that conversation, we talked to a lot of um, our community members saying, hey, how many of you actually ask the company you, you are interviewing with, how do, you, how do they keep you employable? Right, and yeah. and almost surprisingly, none of these guys actually care. And, 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 I, and I was sort of thinking about this particular concept that when when so much automation is taking over, probably you'll be replaced with automation at some point. How do you find your next gig? And then how now it's a question that every every job seeker should ask the employer. How do they? So that's a, that's a very critical point you raised. But. Yeah, and there's and there's a you know a temptation when you're recruiting is that you purely focus on those domain skills that someone brings. You know your mm. your text-to-speech person um, and absolutely you know when you've got a job that needs doing you've got to bring those domain skills and find those domain skills but I would argue and as we go back to the very start of the podcast because of the rate of change mm. if you have someone who is very open to learning right is a an autodidact is someone who likes to learn who recognizes their own shortcomings someone who works well in the team, someone who is prepared to put the effort in to, to build and rebuild their skills, now, that's in, an incredibly valuable resource to have. So yes, in the short term, oh my God, we've got to have a text-to-speech expert this week with this particular mm. set of skills. I mean, mm. 
And that's mm. one thing. If, if that's if that's what's driving you, great. You know, look for contractors, look for the gig economy, look for whatever. If you're talking about a more long-term employee, then it should be much less about what are the particular domain skills they happen to have today, mm. and what what is that much more rounded, four-dimensional capability, right? Are they flexible? Are they curious? Are they willing to learn? Are they self-reflecting? Are, are they humble? Mm. Right. All those types of things, I would argue, are going to make you much more employable in the future. Because that's when things are changing so quickly, you know, the ability to work alongside you know, robots in the broadest possible sense, whether it's, it's physical robots or, or you know, cognitive robots, um, the ability to operate in that environment where you, know, you have to exploit the things that people are good at. Mm. Um, and pure domain skill may not be one of them, right? Mm. The ability to be flexible and know how to respond and make critical decisions and be comfortable with ambiguity. You know, mm. one of the things that humans generally are very good at, at least some people, um, are being comfortable with ambiguity and being thrown mm. in at the deep end and figuring it out. You know, that's why we still have humans on the International Space Station because they can figure it out. Right, now, interesting. How that's going to go over time, you know, as things like AlphaGo, you know, become uh, wider as mm -hmm. as we get more generalized AI that are capable of learning at speed. Um, who knows where that's going to go? But I say some of those core. If if I was out there looking for work today or thinking about how do I future proof myself, then it's going to be a lot of those softer skills that are going to be as important or in some cases more important than the fact that I, you know, can program in, you know, whatever the latest deep AI neural net programming language happens to be. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, I, I, I want your perspective on one thing. So you are providing a software for learning, right? So yep. you are helping folks learn. So from your vantage point or from your lens, would you see a future um, so who should own the learning piece should the company own the uh, owns the learning of their employees or should the employee or individual should be responsible or what are some of the trends that you are seeing from your yeah I, mean, I i think that's a false dichotomy i mean the answer has to be both hmm. right? i mean so as a responsible organization every company has to make sure that it has the capability to execute its own business Mm. Right? If if you take the eye off the ball, then, then why hell why the hell are you in business in the first place? Mm. So, uh, I think it is it is disingenuous of any company just to say you're all responsible for your own learning. Have fun, mm. right? Because not everybody knows the company direction. Not everybody understands the company strategy. Not everybody knows necessarily what they need to be successful. And so, I would argue that any company should first and foremost take responsibility for ensuring that mm. the people that they work with, whether they are employees, whether they're contractors, whether it's the gig economy, that they have the capability to execute whatever their business strategy is. And whether that's investing in their own employees or finding the right people in you know, the gig economy to, to bolster those skills, then you know, you've got to do that. But as an individual, I can't abdicate responsibility. I can't just mm. sit back and say, you know, teach me. Mm. Right? Because, you know, there's no guarantee I'm going to work for this company forever. There's no guarantee I'm going to have that job tomorrow. Right? Mm. If I'm, I need to be employable. Um, and, you know, it's that classic thing where the world is moving forward. And if you're not moving forward, you are going backwards. You're getting left mm. behind. So I would argue that every, in the same way that every company has a responsibility to its employees, every person has a responsibility both to the company and to themselves to seek out new learning opportunities, to recognize the value. I mean, one of my old bosses had this great thing uh, who said, you have to constantly think about how do I provide 20 times my value? to the company, mm. right? R regardless of what they're paying me, how do True. I deliver 20 times True. that value back? And part True. of that has to be taking care of my own self-development. Um, mm. And those people that sit there and wait to be told or wait to be taught, 
are not the ones who are going to be most successful and most employable. Interesting, interesting. So, um, fabulous, Nick. And, and by the way, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. We, I'm, oh, I'm almost just so mesmerized with the conversation. It's hard for me to keep keep up with the time. So, <laughs> yeah, we're well, uh, at the top of the hour. Yes. So, th- thank you so much on that. So, uh, I have a few last questions and, and yep. I, I promise I'll, I'll make it quick for you. That's good. So, in your journey, the I want to know what are some of the some of tenets in your journey that has uh, contributed greatly in your success uh, yep. so far. Um, first and foremost, my number one rule is if you're not having fun, find something else to do. Right? There's a couple of changes I've made during that journey from chemical engineer to here, which were fundamentally triggered by, oh my God, I'm not enjoying this anymore. Like life is too short. So number one, regardless of what you do, make sure you enjoy it. Um, number two um, is, is a kind of everything we've been talking about today, that whole learning approach, that, that curiosity. Um, I have, I've always been interested in, in finding out more, understanding how the world works. Um, and, you know, the folks that I've seen who have been very successful regardless of the role that they've done have had that humility to know that they don't know everything you know that that old quote the more and more i learn the more i realize the less i know Hmm. Um, and and so that's a big one um you know the golden rule it's it's trite but you know treat everybody the way that you would like to be treated Hmm. you know goes a long way regardless whether it's business or personal life um, and then I think a big one, particularly in, in the corporate world that I've tried to employ wherever I've been, particularly when I have a team working for me, is there's no such thing as, as over-communication. Like, mm, I, 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 I want to be completely transparent. Mm. Um, and my experience has shown me time and time again that if you're going to delegate, then the best way to get people to make the right decisions is to give them the most possible information they can so that they've got that context in which to make decisions. If you look at managers who fail, often it's because they hoard information Hmm. and that creates an environment where other people can mess up, where if they just had more info, they could do a much better job. Interesting. Um, So, Thank you so much for sharing that thought, by the way. I really appreciate that. So one more thing I, I definitely want to know from, from the guest is their favorite read because this gives us yeah. an insight into what they're thinking and what's going on. So if you, can you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, so, so <laughs> much. I have a shelf shelves full of books behind me. But one, uh, so I, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a read as a choice of two um, that are both somewhat Better. related, actually. Um, one is a book called The End of Average, by Todd mm. Rose, mm. Um, which uh, is a fascinating read. Any parent should read it, um, and I would argue that anybody in any company should read it as well. It's a fascinating read on uh, treating people as individuals and what the science says, mm. um, and it has all kinds of applications. It's a fascinating read. Um, the other one, particularly to AI, uh, and uh, possibly many of your readers have already uh, oh, Many of your viewers have already uh, read this, but Nick Bostrom's book, um, which is Super Intelligence. Mm. I want to call it Singularity. It's about the singularity. Mm. It's about where mm. generalized AI may go and how quickly it may go. Um, and I would suggest that not simply because it's talking about AI, um, but even if you're not interested in AI, some of the ideas it has about how work might change going forward mm. and whether jobs are going to be eliminated and how quickly they might be eliminated. Um, it's very, very fluid. Nobody quite knows how quickly these things are going to go. But at least uh, Nick talks about some of the factors that are in play and gives you a framework on which you can maybe think about how that might apply to you. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, before we part ways, do you have do you have any any closing thought for our, for our, for our uh, listeners and viewers? Um, uh, only to be a lifelong learner, I suppose, is the biggest one. You know, we've spent the entire hour talking about how things are changing, the speed mm. that things are changing, 
um, the the worst thing that I think anybody can do is think they know everything. Mm. Um, and so regardless of whether it's in your personal life, in your work life, with your kids, you know, be prepared to learn uh, constantly. And you know, if you look at the people who are venerated most, the yogis and the the, the monks that really seem to be centered. You know, the thing that defines them is the fact that they are always open to learning. Interesting. With that, thank you so much, Nick, for uh, you. spending your generous more than an hour uh, with our folks, uh, sharing your insights. It was truly mesmerizing, uh, and it's, I think uh, this this could very well qualify as a as a therapy uh, <laughs> session as well for to to many people who are in the learning and development space. So definitely do do appreciate your time here. You're always welcome back on the podcast to share your journey and any ways we could be of any help. Um, thank you so much. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, have a good one. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.